as a survivor, as a victim, as someone, I, I again, I try to put myself in this position. What if somebody made a scripted show with actors portraying my father and my father's abuse of, of not only my mother and myself, but but other women that he was involved in with relationships. Uh, what about, uh, you know, portraying my sister and my half sister and my relatives and how they would be portrayed. And then of course, you know, obviously with things like a film or television series, they do take creative liberty because they're there to tell a story. It is entertainment. So, and then if they were to take creative liberty on my story and maybe they decide to conjure up some stuff about my mother. So my father had all these stories about my mother, you know, being involved in a baby selling ring and a, and a Chinese gold smuggling ring and nonsense like that when he was trying to appeal his case and use that as evidence by using, well, look at the, over there, this person did, you know, which is obviously all fabrications, right? But what if those fabrications end up becoming sort of facts in the mind of the viewer who is viewing the entertainment that people are creating and then therefore they are consuming. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself. And it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers. Welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? What's going on, people? Happy Friday. I want to start this episode off and just uh, send out my thoughts and prayers to the victims of Hurricane Ian in southeastern Florida. Reach out and say I'm with you guys and um, I'm hoping and praying for the best for all of you. I know it's the devastation has just been really tough. So, um, yeah. Just want to say that to start off the program, thinking about you guys. It has been an interesting week for me. I think I had mentioned last week's episode that my mother's birthday was this past Wednesday, which was September 28th. And um, uh, this time of year always brings up some interesting, uh, some interesting thoughts in my head. And, you know, I don't know. I It's, it's a strange, it's an odd week for me, or it's an odd day, I should say. Um, Cause I often wonder like what my mother would be like if she was this age. But I, you know, I talked about this last week and um, I don't really want to delve too much into it. Uh, so on that note, uh, I want to say thank you for all my supporters on Patreon that have been here and um, all of you that are downloading and, uh, and subscribing to the podcast on Apple podcasts, Spotify. Thank you so much for your very kind reviews. There's a lot of been really nice reviews that have been coming on about the program lately. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you to all you guys that find me on TikTok. I uh, appreciate you guys, all 308,000 of you. It's very cool. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please remember to click like and subscribe. It helps with the algorithm. Uh, on that note, I want to go to this week's listener question of the week. And this comes from Hello There on YouTube. And he is responding to an episode that I did about my father, one of my father's letters from prison and uh, when he was incarcerated in his very first year. And hello there writes, your father's letter is so crazy. He talks about himself and his emotions. There is no empathy for you and the situation you are in as a result of his actions. No mention of your upcoming birthday. My father has been diagnosed with a personality disorder, narcissistic, sociopathic, antisocial. He has been so verbally abusive and creates so much chaos and trouble for our entire family. He always talks about himself. Never any thoughts or concerns of anyone else. Sometimes he'd say to me, don't work so hard. WTF, I work so hard because I have to pick up all of his messes. Six DUIs, going out with prostitutes, shoplifting, exploiting anyone he can and the constant crazy making. It took me until the age of 54 to realize that he's the one with all the problems. And my sister and I, my sister committed suicide 
had to deal with a severely mentally ill father. Thank you, Collier. Your podcasts make me feel like I am not in this alone. That's tough. September is National Suicide Awareness Month in the United States. And um, my heart goes out to you at the loss of your sister. It's sad when the parent or the person who has these personality disorders, if you want to call them that, their chaos and destruction affects so many people. And it doesn't have to be murder. It just shows that like this is again, someone whose self-destructive habits trickle down to his children, right? Full disclosure, I was just on a podcast, which will come out probably in the next couple months with my co-host Tara Newell uh, of Survivor Squad, which will be coming out at the beginning of the year, 2023. And uh, we were interviewed on a podcast on Red Table Talk called uh, Navigating Narcissism with Dr. Romani. And we got into some very interesting conversations. Obviously, Tara with her, uh, with taking the, the life of Dirty John Meehan in self-defense and uh, myself with putting my father in prison for murdering my mother. And we had some very interesting conversations around psychopathy and sociopathy. And obviously, because the program is called Navigating Narcissism, narcissism. One of the things that is very interesting to discuss with somebody like Dr. Romney is the just they are so immersed in talking to people who have been through this. And I listened to some of her other episodes and they are very, very powerful. And this, you know, narcissistic personality disorder, look, I'm not a psychologist. I just have experience, but uh, it is a very destructive force and it is very scarring. And, and, you know, I was talking about on the program where sometimes I am realizing still how I am as an adult in my 40s now, still coming to terms with destruction from my father and habits that I learned as a child, like appeasement, because of the dynamic between my mother and my father and my father's abuse and the way that he was towards us and the tiptoeing that constantly had to happen growing up and all of those things and how those affect me into adulthood. And, and it, you almost get into this fight or flight sort of state. So, you know, I always recommend, <clears throat> look, I am in therapy. I'm in talk therapy. Uh, I'm a big advocate of it. I probably don't talk about it enough on this program, to be honest with you. But uh, I say for anyone who is, finds themselves in those situations where they are trying to cope with a parent with narcissistic personality disorder or these sociopathic tendencies, antisocial behaviors, you know, get yourself some help. Look after yourself first. You do not have to clean up these people's messes. You know, unfortunately you're, you're kind of caught in it, but you need to always take care of yourself. You never want to let it get to you and get to a certain point where you feel like there's no hope and you have to take your own life. So that's my two cents on the subject. Hello there. I am really glad that you reached out. I'm glad that you, that my podcasts make you feel like you're not in this alone. It's cool. It makes me feel like the work that I'm doing here is really helping and reaching people and reaching you guys as my audience. And as I talk about these things, interestingly enough on the same, I, you know, I, on YouTube, I see all the comments and they kind of come through whether they're on the same video or not. The next comment down from this was somebody that commented and this is a picture that was featured in the article that the New York Post did about the podcast about six months ago, February of this year. And the picture has my father wearing sunglasses. And this person, of course, because the new thing on Netflix is, they commented, they said, your dad has Dahmer glasses. That is an interesting comment because uh, this show Dahmer, which is on Netflix, uh, created by Ryan Murphy, who is the you know mind behind Glee and American Horror Story and um, the Johnny Versace story, a bunch of other other shows. I mean, the guy's pretty up there as far as showrunners in Hollywood, if not at the top <laughs> of showrunners in Hollywood. Uh, him and Shonda Rhimes, I should say. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding this show and. Again, as I was discussing with Dr. Romney, 
and Tara Newell about psychopathy. I was always under the impression that my father was a sociopath. In fact, I actually asked in the film, A Murder in Mansfield, I asked my father if he believes that he is a sociopath because I feel that his genuine lack of remorse or empathy or understanding, just the basic fundamental connectivity that makes us as human beings, the way that we're wired, like we understand other people's emotions and we can empathize with them and that sort of leads us in, and maybe we take some cues towards our behavior because of those perceptions. I always just thought he was a sociopath, but I actually learned and Dr. Phil called it out when I was on his show a couple of years ago. He said, this man is a psychopath. This is a psychopath. I mean, he's, he's answering this in a way that he has convinced himself. He, he's believing it while he's saying it. I think I agree. <laughs> I uh, I have sort of been very, you know, because of this Dahmer show and because of a lot of my friends that are in true crime as survivors, they are very, and I think even family members who whose family members were victims of Jeffrey Dahmer have been sort of speaking out about this, this show and the way that it, it almost glorifies Dahmer as a subject, right? So this has been top of mind for me all week. And then I see this comment and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So you're just relating the fact that my father is wearing sunglasses that look very similar. I mean, I have to agree. They do look like the poster for the Dahmer series, but it's interesting because of our perceptions. But again, top of mind, because it poses some really interesting questions about you know, and I'm constantly talking about ethical true crime. Tara Newell and I discussed this. Uh, Sarah Turney is a big uh, promoter of ethical true crime. Uh, our friends Kara Robinson Chamberlain, uh, Lenora Clare, uh, Kimberly Corbin. We are all on this little chat every week and we all discuss ethical true crime. And, uh, you know, and the impacts that these cases, when they become public, in a way that like, look, okay, Jeffrey Dahmer, I believe was arrested in 1991. So this would have been a year, a little less than a year after my father's trial, right? And so I was very much ingrained in that. So I probably was not paying attention. I mean, it was hard to miss, it was national news, right? I was probably not as absorbed in it as most people because I was still kind of comatose from what happened to me and my family. And look, this is in no way to excoriate. I mean, because look, when actors take on roles, I work in Hollywood, I am a cinematographer. I have worked in this business for over a decade. You know, it is a dream role for a an actor. And I don't remember the actor who plays Jeffrey Dahmer in the show, but all I know is that Niecy Nash is in it. And, and I love Niecy Nash from Reno 911 days, way back in the day. But anyways, I digress on that. You know, it is really a thrill for actors to be able to play such a complex character like this, especially like a psychopath, right? What people seem to forget a lot of times is that when these shows come out, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a show on Netflix, whether it's a Dateline episode, it is very easy for us nowadays to just literally Google, okay, Jeffrey Dahmer victims. Okay, cool. And then we find one of the victims and we go, oh, okay. Oh, I wonder if they have a Facebook, they have a social media, this and that. And as I get, you know, hundreds of questions a week on my Instagram and on my my Facebook, my YouTube, my, wherever you find me, TikTok. Look, I put myself out there. So I, I'm fair game. You can ask me anything you want. I am an open book. I always have been. It is just kind of the way that I have coped with the trauma that I've been through my entire life. I've just shared my story. That's just been my thing. But for some people, they just want it to go away. <laughs> they don't want to think about it again. They don't want to think about the hurt that has been inflicted upon them by this psychopath who took the life of their loved one. Anyways, it can be very challenging to navigate these parasocial relationships when you are just trying to move through the trauma yourself and forget about what happened. And these television shows come out, or these podcasts, or whatever it is, and movies, and again, you, the trauma is just cascading down on all these families and all of these victims all over again. <laughs> to add insult to injury, the real 
issue that a lot of people are having with these programs, and I would concur, is they tend to glorify the killer. <laughs> they tend to sort of put them on a pedestal where people who are fascinated by them, right? Fascinated by the crimes that they committed, fascinated by their sort of wanton abuse of the lives of other people, right? That they're, they're just the, the callousness with which they operate is, is fascinating to a lot of people, but they tend to almost feel like they're glorified. And I think that's probably the biggest thing for victims. I mean, I try to put myself in, in the shoes of these people, you know, because a lot of people are going to go, Oh, it's entertainment and it's fair game. It's like, yeah, it, it is entertainment for people in a way that like, yes, it's a story. Yes. A movie is made. Yes. There are actors portraying these people, but it's still for the victims is very key because it just drags everybody through the trenches. And again, I can literally pull up a cell phone and type in Jeffrey Dahmer's victims and find their relatives. I mean, we have such, we have such a information available at our fingertips nowadays that when you go and you delve into you know, something like the Jeffrey Dahmer case, you can find, you can probably track down their relatives. I mean, I have no interest in doing that. I don't even look at that. I don't know a lot about Jeffrey Dahmer. All I know is he was a horrific monster who I believe he, he murdered 17 people. That's, I think just the people they know about and the things that he did are absolutely, they're horrifying. They're horrifying. And, um, and my heart goes out to those to those families because now they are having to relive all of this and it's like oh and now it's this great thing and oh it's ryan murphy doing it and this that and the other and what is the answer really with ethical true crime so um you know i don't know this was just i don't mean to go on a rant about this this is just top of mind for me uh because of the series many of my friends are talking about it there's a lot of stuff out there on the interwebs discussing it. And, um, I have some friends that are on both sides of this, the coin, if you will, you know, some people just were like, well, it's just entertainment. Some people were like, this is really affecting the victims. I mean, I probably would err more on the side of, yeah, I'm on the victim side, uh, as a survivor, as a victim, as someone I, I again, I try to put myself in this position. What if somebody made a scripted show with actors portraying my father and my father's abuse of of not only my mother and myself but but other women that he was involved in with relationships uh what about uh you know portraying my sister and my half sister and my relatives and how they would be portrayed and then of course you know obviously with things like a film or television series they do take creative liberty <laughs> because they're there to tell a story. It is entertainment. So, and then if they were to take creative liberty on my story, and maybe they decide to conjure up some stuff about my mother. So my father had all these stories about my mother, you know, being involved in a baby selling ring and a, and a Chinese gold smuggling ring and nonsense like that when he was trying to appeal his case and use that as evidence by using, well, look at the, over there, this person did, you know, which is obviously all fabrications, right? But what if those fabrications end up becoming sort of facts in the mind of the viewer who is viewing the entertainment that people are creating and then therefore they are consuming? Poses a lot of moral questions and I don't know the answer because, you know, who knows? It's, um, it's a very fine line to walk, but you know, a lot of people ask me, viewers ask me, listeners ask me, hey, you know, I'm trying to be really more conscientious about the way that I consume true crime. And I think that that is a good thing. So I'm going to digress off of all of that point, but, um, all because the guy had to say your dad's wearing Dahmer glasses. That's what sparked this, whole, this whole little, this soapbox rant on that sort of note of the psychopathy of things and my father. So I had a relative that, um, recently reached out to me that found, let me give a little context here. When my father was up for appeals and lately on the program, I have been reading letters around the time period of 1994 and 1995, which was when my father was trying to, um, was trying to get an appeal to overturn his conviction for murdering my mother. 
he cited a bunch of random facts <laughs> or facts that he created in his mind. Uh, one of those things was, as I was mentioning, uh, my mother was having an affair with a police officer, David Messmore um, of the Mansfield Police Department, which was just happened to be the investigator that listened to me, that my mother was dead, who never knew my mother, never met her before, but that they were having a long-term love affair. That was one theory. There was another theory of, uh, you know, this Chinese gold smuggling. And then there was very wealthy families that decided to, to frame my father. And then there were, you know, it, it, it's all this sort of very, uh, it's just, it's crazy town, right? It, these letters that I've been reading are from 1994, 1995. And my father was trying to, you know, win this appeal to overturn his conviction. It was using all these conspiracy theories as evidence of the case of the fact that he is innocent. And a relative of mine reached out because she found what is the Dr. John Boyle newsletter. And this newsletter was sent out by my father through who I believe is my uncle, uh, his brother, my uncle Charles, who's my godfather, one of the people that has turned their back on me <laughs> during this whole time. Uh, still don't talk to him. Don't communicate with him. Uh, it is what it is. What can I say? I've tried so much to communicate with my family over the years, and it's just not worked. Both sides, mother and father. But we, we've talked about that many times on the program. I'm not going to get into that again. She found this this particular relative of mine is a distant relative, a uh, second cousin who's come back into my life uh, or come into my life for the first time, really. I never even knew her. But she happened to find this, <laughs> this because her uh, husband was married to her ex-husband who, who passed away from covid in 2020, he uh, was my father's first cousin and randomly had this newsletter, which this newsletter was only, to my knowledge, given out to the people in Mansfield, Ohio, prominent people in Mansfield to sort of disclose these discrepancies in the case and all of these things. And my father uh, obviously sent this to his cousin. And I'm going to read a little bit of it because it's really, really interesting. Uh, well, I mean, of course it's interesting. It comes from my father. It's just, it's insane. So this is dated, oh, actually this is copyright 1991. I'm so sorry. This is 1991. So this is all after my father was still, this is October, 1991. This, uh, this came out that it was issued. Okay, so it says, non obstante verdicto, the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter. Now, uh, I am actually gonna put this on my Patreon for those of my who are on my Patreon and support me. You will get to see this actual newsletter. I'm gonna put that on Patreon uh, this weekend. And, uh, you know, and I'll discuss it with everyone because I do monthly meet and greets on my Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash call your Landry. Shameless plug, but there you go. I'm gonna put this on my Patreon so oh, you guys can read it because it's uh, eight pages long, but I'm not gonna get into the whole thing, obviously. But uh, this says, non obstante verdicto, the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter, copyright 1991 by Dr. John F. Boyle Jr. October 1991. Introduction. The Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter is a totally free nonprofit publication which will serve to inform its readership of the unique manner in which justice is operated in the city of Mansfield, Ohio, and in the surrounding areas of Richland County. The illegal conviction of Dr. John F. Boyle Jr. was a travesty of the judicial system in Ohio and harkens back to an earlier time in our state. Back then, another osteopathic physician, Dr. Sam Shepard, was painted as the most evil human being to call Ohio his home. Then, as now, unscrupul unscrupulous prosecutors and a select few unethical police officers engaged in a cover-up of unimagined callousness and subverted the system of justice. The statements, facts, and questions you find in this newsletter are the ones that the prosecutor and the police don't have the courage to answer. The truth here is stranger than any fiction and is based upon the facts of the case. Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack just in this first paragraph. So my father is using, uh, is referencing the um, Dr. Sam Shepard case. Now, Dr. Sam Shepard, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but he was the guy who claimed the one-armed man did it. Uh, he was a doctor who also killed his wife, and ironically, in Ohio, and obviously an osteopathic surgeon, or, or physician, rather. 
So the film, The Fugitive, was loosely based on this Dr. Sam Shepard case, uh, which is interesting. So my father's drawing parallels to that, and it's just, it's a whole thing. Now, I don't, again, I don't know. I'm sure people will write to me on YouTube and say, or write to me in the comments and say, hey, look, you know, this is what happened with the case, blah, blah, blah. This is what's going on. Uh, I'm, you guys know more than I do. I don't know if his conviction was overturned or not. I know there was a lot going on. I believe he even died in prison, but I'm not sure. I don't really know a lot about the Dr. Sam Shepard case. I should perhaps educate myself, but I wasn't prepared for this because I am literally reading this newsletter for the first time because I don't think I ever read it actually. Now, when I was back in Ohio recently going through my stuff at my parents' house, I was looking for this newsletter, but we did not find it. So it is very cool that uh, my cousin found this and sent this to me. So I want to read on. So then it goes to a little box area and it says volume number, volume one, number one, for the record, the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter has been developed, researched, prepared, and distributed entirely with donated materials and private resources. No public materials or funding have been utilized to bring this, to bring you the Dr. Jo Jack Boyle newsletter. Unsolicited monies or materials are neither encouraged nor accepted. <laughs> The further publication, reproduction, and or redistribution of the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter is not permitted without the express prior written release of the copyright holder. All rights retained by the author. Commercial advertising is not accepted. You may contact the copyright holder on matters related to the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter through the following address. And it gives an address in Arlington, Virginia. Well, I guess I must be in violation of the copyright of the Dr. Jack Boyle newsletter. Um... Good luck, guys, getting anything out of me. Thanks and recognition to all, it says. I take this collaborative opportunity to thank my devoted family members, loyal friends, colleagues, and numerous former patients for their memorable letters and communications of support over the last two years. I have undertaken the development and distribution of this newsletter to communicate with all of you in a more timely manner concerning events related to the case. Due to the rising number of letters and requests for information on my case, I am unable to, unable to answer all of you as quickly as I would prefer to do so. However, my newsletters will help keep all of you informed of facts and events that you will probably never see covered com completely in the Mansfield News Journal. As I now concentrate on preparing more legal briefs for the battles ahead, I shall work hard to keep you all informed. Perhaps even my most bitter adversaries will be enlightened from these newsletters about me and maybe themselves and our city of Mansfield. So what exactly is a verdicto? You might well ask, but this word and the question it provokes in Richland County is at the heart of my case. Precisely the title of this newsletter derives from the legal term known and entered in our courts today as NOV. The term is more commonly employed in, illegals, in legal usage as a directed verdict and translates from Latin as notwithstanding the verdict. Our courts, that is the judge, can determine a judgment NOV, despite what the jury delivers when he rules the verdict ha and has no support in the facts of the case or is contrary to the law. Our U.S. Constitution provides us all with the guarantees of a fair trial and a proper defense based upon the facts and not passion. Criminal law today protects defendants from a directed verdict of guilty and allows for the judgment of, of acquitted NOV, not guilty, for the accused for the accused as the only verdict that can be reasonably returned based upon the facts that the, of the law before the court. My case is one that will surely enter the law books of Ohio as a most unique, to, unique selective presentation of the facts, dot, 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 and the law. Oh man, the ellipses are, by the way, in full effect in this newsletter, by the way. There's one, two, three, four, five, six ellipses so far. Notwithstanding this verdict against me, I am an innocent man. Those old Romans knew a thing or two about their language and the application of law. Our modern United States law knows its heritage of the Romans, their Latin words, and the meaning of the verdict. My battle for justice is, is one that I shall win based upon the law and all of the facts, not just those that suit the state of Ohio. I will fight to win any freedom from this miscarriage of justice. As those Romans used to say, no nemo et supra legis. That is, nobody is above the law. And that includes not only me, but those who investigated and presented me for murder. 
Oh my goodness. Well, what's really ironic <laughs> about all of this, if you can use that word, is the fact that my father is guilty. He did murder my mother. Uh, he even admits it in the film of Murder in Mansfield to killing her or she was in self-defense, whatever his crazy story is. In the film, for those of you who've seen it, you know uh, he's responsible for his de her death, whatever he says. But this was written, you know, less than two years or less than, you know, well, a little over a year after he was convicted. And it's just utter lunacy. So getting back to what I was saying at the beginning of the program about psychopaths. So there is something that I learned recently, like I said in a podcast, psychopaths, all of their behavior, what dis what differentiates them between sociopaths is psychopaths follow a behavioral pattern from my understanding. Again, I am not a psychologist, but psychopaths are very calculated in everything they do. Everything that they do is calculated. Whereas a sociopath sort of will do things, will kind of become unhinged at times. They they lack impulse control at times. They um, they lack restraint at times. They give in to their urges at times, uh, without remorse, of course, because they're sociopaths, right? It's all about them. But a psychopath will literally just plot it all out and it all has to fit a very particular order coming having that information brought to light to me i was like wow that makes a lot of sense what dr phil said this man's a psychopath it makes a lot of sense because my father planned out my mother's murder and a lot of people uh, from what i understand some people don't understand that my father committed premeditated murder so he planned my mother's murder he ran into the jackhammer as w a couple episodes ago, I talked to the, to the judge, you know, he talked about the, the running of the jackhammer. He talked about the running of the cold storage to store my mother's body. You know, uh, he, per my father purchased the indoor outdoor carpeting that my mother was buried underneath, um, in the basement of his home in Erie, Pennsylvania. He purchased that and that was on our porch <laughs> at our house in Mansfield, Ohio, while my mother was still alive. There was indoor outdoor carpeting rolled up and then there was a tarp that was my mother's body was found in. It was a blue tarp. My mother's body was found in this tarp. This was on our pat like our our out like sunroom patio, like screened in porch thing for months, like in the summertime. So my father was plotting to kill all to kill my mother for a very long time. And uh, ultimately my, my sort of conclusion of this was, you know, he, my mother, when my father introduced me to his mistress and, you know, was so brazen to kiss her in front of me. And I told my mother about it and everything. That was when I think he really firmly made the decision that he was going to end her life because she had committed the ultimate violation against him, which was calling him out on his bullshit. <laughs> when she filed for divorce, that was the ultimate injury to him because it's all about him because psychopathy apparently is even above narcissism and sociopathy because it then becomes a calculated a very calculated situation where they're like okay you did this to me now i'm going to do this 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 and it's all done without remorse it's done without any sort of human connection whatsoever it is all about them you've injured me, I'm coming after you and I'm going to either, you know, take your life. I'm going to dismantle your life. I'm going to do all these things to you because you injured me. It is very poisonous. It is very toxic. It is terrifying. And my father did that. You know, he, he, he murdered her. He, he had rented, he had purchased a house with the intent of lowering the basement floor, according to the realtor, wanted to know what the basement floor was there. So he's okay. I'm going to dig a grave in there, purchase the tarp, purchase the, the astro indoor outdoor carpeting. And then, uh, you know, rented the jackhammer and the cold storage and then, and then proceeded to proceeded to go through with the crime. <laughs> and that is all very typical of a psychopath. It's a hard pill to swallow. There was a lot of conversations that I had this week that were really, really hard pills to swallow for me because in this, I had just sort of, you know, again, when Dr. Phil told me, Hey, this man's a psychopath, right? I was like, okay, well, you know, I guess, but I think he's a sociopath. So I kind of held on to that belief. I still think my father's a horrible, horrible person. But now 
when you add the psychopathy element to it, it's almost, it's even, it becomes even worse and more egregious. So again, when this gentleman says on YouTube in this comment, your dad wears Dahmer glasses, perhaps he and Jeffrey Dahmer have a lot more in common. And that's a really scary thought because at this moment in time, like when I think about this and all of these new things coming to light that I'm still discovering about my father and even reading something like this newsletter or, or hearing stories from other people, uh, you know, there was a woman that my father had dated when my mother and I were living in Virginia, when we were all living in Virginia. And my mother even confronted her and said, you know, he'll have more girlfriends. You're not the only girlfriend. Are you crazy? And I guess my father wanted her to meet him in Chicago and she refused because I think she was like 19 or 20 at the time and she refused and then he blew her off. Well, th I think, you know, her, her sort of, her sort of realization after the murder was like, oh, that could have been me too. I think that if my father had gotten away with murdering my mother, there would have been more victims. I think that's really what I'm trying to say in this entire diatribe that I've been putting on this whole time during the show. I am almost convinced at this point, I think I am convinced that there would have been more victims. Had my father gotten away with murdering my mother, it would have been so easy for him to just do it again. Whether that would have been his mistress, Sherry, girlfriend who he maybe would have married, whether it maybe it would have been someone else that he was having an affair with that threatened his existence or his ego in a way where he was injured by their actions or their reactions to his actions. I think that it would have really that they, they, they could have ended up being victims themselves. And that's a really chilling thought. So that I think is probably my biggest takeaway from this whole Dahmer series is, which I haven't seen, I haven't watched uh, other than a few minutes of it because it's scary, honestly. But for me, the scary thing is, is that recognizing this week with all this talk that my father indeed is a psychopath. And there would have been more victims. I'm convinced of that. And on a week where my mother would have turned 77 years old and hopefully still would have been here in my life, but she is in, in a spiritual sense. She's always with me. That is a hard pill to swallow. So uh, on that note, I'm Collier Landry and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.